when we design things uh, as engineers and designers and, and technicians, our job is to make it cost less, make it just strong enough to, you know, when you start talking to people about designing an aircraft and you say, it's going to be designed to, so it's just strong enough, that could lead to some issues. You know, people, you know, get all nervous. But when you think about your house, you walk on a floor and the floor is really a composite of different things. It's not one solid piece that's, you know, 12 inches thick or 15 inches thick. It's, it's a series of ribs with, with uh, a covering so we walk and don't fall through. Same is true with bridges. You know, you look at some of the early bridges and they're very monstrous things and, and now we have very lightweight. So the whole idea is to make things as light as possible. You know, when the, when the government sets fuel standards for automobiles, one way you achieve greater fuel efficiency is to make the car lighter. So, um, you know, having worked on, I think the earliest car I worked on was a, a 34 V8 Ford, and it was just a rolling pile of steel. <laughs> It was not smooth rolling, we might add, but uh, cars have increased uh, a lot in the last uh, 50 to 100 years. And, you know, the same thing is true. Every year we get better at designing so we can take some uh, weight and some structure out and still have the same performance. And that's, that's what design is all about. It's like, well, how much can we take out and still be safe enough? So we come across this concept of factor of safety, all right? So if we say, okay, this slide has got to hold two children that are 55 pounds, all right? So we now have 110 pounds of what we call impact load because they're not uh, just going to be stationary. So it's not a dead load, like if it snows, you know, the snow sits there, that's a dead load. And then it's not a live load where we bring things in and just set it on there, but it's, it's really an impact load because they're jumping up and down and rolling over everything. And then we say we, we need a factor of safety because, you know, if we say we're designing it for 110 pounds and we make it to 109 pounds, that might not be good enough. You know, some, some parent would be all upset with us because, you know, we crushed their child. So we say, well, what are the factors we have to look at? So the first thing we want to look at is, is well, how complex is the device that we're actually analyzing? right? The more complex it is, the, the harder it is to predict how each part works with the other. So we end up throwing in extra factor of safety uh, to make sure that we're on the safe side. Then you take a look at consequences of failure, right? So, you know, in the case of airplanes or playground equipment where, you know, people would get hurt if something went wrong, Factor of safety has to be uh, much larger than it would be than if we were designing a pencil, all right? Because with the pencil, you know, what can happen? Well, we can snap it in half. We can do uh, some strange things with it. I have a couple of uh, pencil scars where I was stabbed with a pencil, you know, it left the, uh, the graphite under the skin, but all those things, it, that's not quite so critical. So uh, we take a look at what are the consequences of failure? What's going to happen when we expose it to the environment? You know, so in the case of a merry-go-round, well, it's going to get rained on, snowed on, frozen. Uh, you know, case of roads, we throw salt on them. We do uh, all kinds of, you know, funky things. Something that's going to sit in a dry room inside your house or in a library, okay, we don't have to take that kind of environmental. So you have to weigh the environmental factors when you consider how much you have to over-design. We take a look at something called material strength. You know, so uh, if, if I have a plastic rod, it bends You know when I, I push on it. If I have a steel rod, it bends when I push on it. It might bend a little differently than the, the plastic rod. 
So then we have to go back into, you know, what people have discovered about different kinds of materials. You know, some are stronger than others. Then there's the potential misuse of the project. You know, so if, if you have a slide with a cover on it, uh, you know that there's going to be two or three kids that'll go up and sit on it while other people are underneath. So we know that we didn't want people to sit on the roof, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that they will. Uh, there's a reason why we build school buildings out of concrete blocks and metal and, you know, basically really hard things because uh, kids are really hard on stuff. You know? So, you know, we take a look at, you know, what, what are the potential misuse? Then we talk about quality control. You know, so how accurately can we make the piece that we're designing? So one of my, my son's first jobs was working uh, with a company called General Motors and they, they have this charcoal canister that sits under the, the hood of the car and it's warranted for a year. So one of the um, desires of the new charcoal canister was that it would last 55 weeks. Right, because you know, if it goes a day past the 52 week mark of the year, then they no longer have to cover it. All right, so they want to make sure that they're covered, but they don't want to pay too much extra for that ability. So it's you've got to go back to you know how accurate is our quality control. Then there are things like uh, you know the relative size you know, or what we call the mass effect. Um, when we, we get into uh, buildings, for example, you take a Walmart, well, we've got a wall in Walmart that might be 20 feet high and 140, 160 feet long. You get a good wind like we had uh, yesterday blowing against that wall. It's an awful lot of force that, that comes in there that you wouldn't normally think about. Um, you know, a sailing ship, uh, you know, back in the 1830s, 1840s, the most powerful devices that humans built were these sailing ships. You know, right? they had, you know, thousands of horsepower generated by the sails to move them through the oceans. Then the type of load we put in it, all right? So uh, if you're designing it just to put things on it, it's like the surface of a desk, okay, I'm gonna put some books on, I'm gonna put a few other things but it's not really meant for tap dancing, right? So, you know, when we design stages for theaters uh, and theater sets, we got to make sure that, okay, they're going to do some really strange things. You know, people are going to jump off of things and, and jump down and, and hit the ground really hard. So that's an impact load. And so, you know, we've got a lot of different ways that, that things are, are stressed. You know, there's, there's a, an old uh, question I used to ask when I was teaching in the civil engineering end of things. It was like, if a fly lands on this giant I-beam, does the I-beam bend? And, you know, so they, the answer is yes. Everything causes deflection in, in everything else. It's just like the way gravity works. Right, so the planet pulls us, but then we also pull the planet. The fact that the planet is so much bigger than we are, you know, we, we collide in the middle someplace, but we're much closer to the planet's middle than we are to our middle. We take a look at all the different factors of, of the material, uh, whether it's gonna react with something, how strong it is, how rare it is, because uh, there are times when we can substitute a material and it's just as effective and much less expensive, you know, easier on the environment and that type of thing. And then finally, we, we take a look at the cost. You know, when you design something, you say, well, what's the likely sale price of this, this piece and, and is it worth it? So for those of us old enough to remember, we had uh, an argument when they were first putting seat belts in cars. And the argument was it was going to add a lot of extra cost to a car and nobody would be willing to pay for it. Well, 
you know, we padded the dashboards and we no longer let, uh, you know, two-year-olds jump up and down on the front seat while we drive and that type of thing. So uh, obviously the cost came into it, but some things are worth it. And so when we begin to uh, design uh, something, we, we do this mathematical analysis of the design, right? So, you know, you, you take a look at this and basically we can boil it down to, um, in fact, our safety is really based on all kinds of things, but this is a, a formula as a general rule of thumb that we're gonna take the stress and we're going to divide it by a factor of safety. So what that allows us to, you know, the, the ability to do is if we say, okay, we got to have the 110 pounds of the two kids on the slide, factor of safety for this might be 12. So you would multiply and then that would give you, you know, what it is that you're, you're going to end up with. And so we take a look at, at you know, a simple table like this. We've got ductile materials, which are materials that you know, basically we, we, can, we can stress and they'll go back to their original shape. Uh, and if they go to their original shape, you know, it, it'll spring back. And you know, if we exceed that, then the materials deform and break and bend and that type of thing. So, um, we have to make sure that we're, we're good with it. Now, brittle materials, they don't stretch very well. You know, they, they snap. So if you drop a glass, if you drop a plate, you know, if they hit the floor, they're not going to bounce, you know, like a rubber ball will bounce, right? The, the, you know, they're brittle and the parts go everywhere. So as we take a look at it, uh, there are two strengths that are listed on this table. There's yield strength, and then there's ultimate strength. So yield strength is the, um, if I pull a rubber band, it'll stretch, you know, so it's yielding. And then when I release the stress on it, it goes back to its original shape. Same with my, my plastic pen example. If I flex the plastic pen, it flexes back into its normal shape, all right? Ultimate strength is how much can I do that before we pass the point, um, you know, we have an elastic region where it will return to its, its normal shape. And past that, we get into the plastic region. And the plastic region means that, okay, um, if you think about the uh, plastic rings that we put on six packs of things, right? You can stretch it. And if you stretch it a little bit more, it starts to yield and it starts to stretch. And when we let go, it doesn't go back into the shape that would fit that six pack again. Okay. So we've, we've exceeded it. We, we're starting to deform it uh, permanently. All right. So that's the point of plasticity. And then we get into the point where we, we hit the ultimate strength is how much it's pulling against us before it actually breaks. All right, so with brittle materials, we, we take that point and we work with that point. And then we multiply out. So these numbers on the table uh, are stuck into that formula and multiplied. Now, that's I don't want, I don't want to uh, confuse you too much and I don't want to stress you out that we got to break everything down because we have computers that do that job for us. We just have to understand what the computer is actually doing. So when we we take a look at things, we we know our materials and and how they behave. And now uh the other piece of this is what is a shape and how does it the shape affect uh, the strength of, of things. So when you think about school buildings, right, we have columns that go up and they hold these great big giant I-beams above our heads. And there's a reason why we use that I-beam shape. And it all goes to what I call strength of uh, shape. 
Uh, it's called moment of inertia, second moment of area. The physicists and the engineers can't agree on exactly what it is, but we use it as a rough rule of thumb of, you know, how, how this shape is going to behave. So um, it's basically we take any shape that we're going to make, you know, our, our device out of, right? So if we look at the end of, of a piece, we can say, oh, well, it's so tall, it's so wide. Um, very simply, like for a square, you know, square shape on edge, like if we took a two by four and we put it on edge, you could sit on that and it's, it, it's fairly rigid. And if you turn it on, it's flat. When you sit on it, it, it flexes and bounces up and down. And so that all leads into this point. So the moment of inertia is really, um, we are taking a shape or an area, this is why they call it second moment of area. Um, we take little pieces of area all over this and you know, areas measured in square units, you know, square centimeters, square meters, uh, square inches. And so we take that little, little area and we multiply it by the square of the distance from the centroid. Uh, the centroid is the center of uh, mass of whatever area that we're working on. So it might not even be like if we have a C shape, you know, the centroid is really in, in the air in the middle of the C, right? So we're going to multiply uh, those out. So it's measured in uh, inches to the fourth, millimeters to the fourth, centimeters to the fourth, meters to the fourth, right? Because you've got the area times the square of the distance. And so you break the surface all down and then you, you know, throw it into a formula. A lot of times I took this formula and I force uh, students into figuring out a two by four. And, and if you notice, the base times the height cubed, all right? So the taller something is, the much more rigid it is, the more uh, it's really going to hold force in that particular dimension. So this gets us back to why do we have I-beams on a school ceiling, all right? Because the ceiling has weight coming down, snow load and that type of thing. So uh, buildings that are that large, generally we figure the roof is going to flex down three to four inches over the course of the year. You know, you have a heavy rainstorm like we, we had the other day. Well, all right, that roof is going to come down four inches. We've got to allow for everything. So we use these things called capture tracks. So at the very top, then the roof comes in, the capture track just slides over the wall and then goes back up, you know, and, and it holds itself. Bridges are designed to move. Um, you know, we, we fool ourselves into thinking they're stationary, but they really move. Same thing with wings on an airplane. They, they, they do the lots of flapping, uh, not to generate lift, but in the process of going through air pockets and things. So we do an analysis of the shape. You know, so that's basically this formula. So in the x-axis, uh, the, you know, um, moment of inertia is, you know, figured this way. As we move that shape around and do different things with it, the formulas change. So it's really, it used to be a very difficult thing. You know, we would have to go through and, and calculate the whole thing by hand. You know, now we've got... Uh, uh, finite element analysis that we can do in software. And I used to have a friend, uh, George, who, who did it for a living. You know, they would work all week setting up the uh, calculations and then they would run it into a computer and let it run for a better part of three or four days and then they would be able to get their analysis out. And he was complaining that, you know, once he found software like this and they started building the FEA into it, then, you know, it's like, oh, well, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks setting it up when now I can do it with button push in, in five minutes. So, and we also want to, you know, predict deflection. 
right? So if I put all that water load on a roof and it comes down, what's, how much do I allow for it to sag before I say, yeah, we're, we're not safe anymore? And so that's a, another big piece. And again, if you take a look at some of these things, you know, things that are long deflect a whole lot more. So that's where this all fits in. So now we come to the software where we say, all right, let's, let's have the software do our testing. Let's have it run all these calculations for us. And this is just a quick little uh, picture of some uh, testing on a beam. And, and that's the next thing I wanna you know, run through with you is like, well, how do we do analysis on what you design? 